Budweiser is Dr. Brandon Brown, and uh, we're doing a uh, study on the pyroclastic surge deposit of Panem Crater uh, from the eruption uh, 680 years ago. And basically, what we want to find is that if the eruption was, or what we wanted to find was, if the eruption was phreatomagmatic in nature or purely magmatic. And based on stratigraphy and uh, cranial metric analysis, we found that certain things like cross bedding, uh, abundance of accidental lithics, and uh, obsidian chips, that all these indicators were, or all these signs were indicators of phreatomagmatic eruption. Okay. Who's your advisor? Um, Nicole Benuso, doctor, doctor Nicole Benuso, I should say. Um, so my project is actually on studying the recovery of deep marine communities after the Permian-Triassic mass extinction. So I'm basically just looking at the diversity and how it actually changed through time. Um, we went out to the Fossil Hill location and actually dug up some uh, some rocks and we were able to make them into thin sections. From the thin sections. I was actually able to um, make a strat column of what was mudstone, waxstone versus packstone, and that was actually going to tell us how deep the location was at that time. And then I was able to do uh, point counting and did abundancy counts. And from the abundancy counts, I was able to get these numbers. The interesting part when I was doing my research was that we found the presence of forams in about four different locations. And the forums had actually never been mentioned for this location before. So the focus of the project kind of uh, leewayed onto actually talking about these forums so that we can actually understand what's actually going on in the oceans. Obviously, um, as you were well, as you can see on the strat column, that we have the presence of bivalves, and it's almost at 50 percent, and then they go down to about 10 percent. The interesting part about that is that when we actually do see this decrease of bivalves, is when we see the increase of forams. So we're thinking that the forams have something to do with the decrease of the bivalves, but we're not so sure. So we need to go back and actually um, identify the forams down to species level, and then once. They're identified down to species level, they can actually tell us what's going on. resurgent dome that sprouted up that's associated with post-caldera magmatism and I'm going to compare it to magmas that have been from caldera forming magmatism and pre-caldera magmatism to get a relative sense on how this dome formed, whether there was magma, magma mixing involved or if there was a completely new system, a magma system that came up and formed it. So. So, so here, so here we have the possible two mixing events that occurred to form the dome, or it was a completely separate magma. So the schematic showing the completely separate magma coming up to form the dome. Um, I'm going to look at major and trace elements to get a better understanding of uh, the different chemical compositions evolved and evolved. I'm going to do petrography using thin sections. I'm going to date the dome using argon argon dating uh, form blend crystals associated with that dome with the potassium using the potassium and I'm going to try and see if there's any relation between the different events that have occurred to get an, uh, to get a better understanding of the area and other calderas that have formed in other places with resurgent jones to get an idea of when they had formed so there's speculation as to the dome either formed immediately after the caldera had formed or 
there had been a time elapsed where magma mixing had occurred and then a dome sprouted up and this will give us a I guess a new some more insight as to in the area and an understanding of the area and hopefully areas throughout. <laughs> Very good. But, uh, but, um, so here we have the areas, so, so some maps. The dome is located in the northeast corner. So these kind of transpose over here into the Google Earth image. So 760,000 years ago, this, this caldera had formed. We have the early rhyolites, which are associated with uh, post-caldera events, as long, along with the dome, which I'm going to be focusing on. And this will, uh, hopefully this, all the relationships will give us a better idea and some insight into this. So hopefully it all works out and I'll be going up to Pomona College here in the next month and seeing these samples and XRF and I'm looking forward to it. Good. Who's your advisor? Brandon Brown. Good guy. So I'm working with Phil Armstrong and what I'm looking at is uplift rates in Alaska and the main idea is that Alaska is set in a tectonic corner where things are moving from strike slip motion on one side to dip slip on the other. So I'm kind of looking at that corner and how everything's working in there. Um, and so there's been a lot of previous study done. There's been a lot of study done in this area here and a lot of study done in this area here. You have the Pacific plates sliding past and subducting under the North American plates. And uh, there's a lot of information and a lot of movement. And in 1964, they had the largest offset ever recorded in a single event. There was about 10 meters of offset in one location right around here. So there's a lot of motion going on. And so what I'm doing is I'm trying to tie together these two different tectonic areas where you have collision going on here and this bullseye pattern of uplift here. And so I've got the, the age, uh, the rates there. And so basically what's happening is this uh, red is corresponding to one million years. So that's one million years for the rock to come from three kilometers down up to the surface where I pick it up. And so these uplift rates are pretty fast and then these uplift rates are pretty slow. And so you can see there's a collision zone happening here while this bullseye pattern of uplift here where kind of uh, uplift kind of stops for a little bit and then is really focused in this bullseye area which we think is due to uh, the Yucatan being underplated to the North American plate and pushing it up. And so we saw this Copper River and noticed that it's an easy access to rocks and it's right in between these two really different tectonic settings and so we decided to pick up samples across that river and date them and try to see what's happening in that area. And so I've gotten to the point where I'm handpicking crystals so I still don't have ages yet. Um, but once I have those ages back hopefully at the end of the semester um, I can start analyzing them and deciding what I think is happening in the area. Um, one of the really cool things is that um, the Stewart Creek shear zone was right in the area. And Phil and I recognized that off of just the topography, you could see that there was major action happening there, this major motion. And so we took a higher concentration across that shear zone. And the cool thing is, is that in 2011, a new paper came out that started talking about that Stewart Creek shear zone. And uh, Phil actually asked uh, one of the previous people who've done the research in this area whether uh, that, that fault is active, and he said, I don't know. So there's still a lot of open research in that area. And so we're hoping that those ages are going to bring back some kind of motion on that. And when we actually went there, there was like a hundred feet of offset between, you know, the cliff on one side and the ground on the other side. So there's probably quite a bit of motion in the area. And so I've got these four kind of proposed outcomes. Um, either all the ages are going to be older, or all the ages are going to be younger. Um, there might be a lot of variability in the ages, or hopefully we'll see some major offset across that Stewart Creek shear zone. I'm thinking it's going to be some kind of mixture between these two, where you're seeing major uplift happening towards the ocean, and then moving to less uplift towards the north. And hopefully with some sort of offset across that Stewart Creek shear zone, so that we can relate some sort of dips of motion on the Stewart Creek shear zone. It was an absolutely incredible trip, and I absolutely love Alaska. It was a cool opportunity, um, and I highly recommend people visit that place if they have a chance. Thank you.
is the pint glass number 834578. Anybody? <laughs> 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 All right, next award. What do you want to do? Water bottle? Next award is a water bottle, ironically, with an elephant on it. The number, last three numbers are 552. Anybody? Five, five, two. Elizabeth, here she comes. Yay! In case you get thirsty. Here you go. You're welcome. Okay. Field Camp Coloring Book. Coloring Kit. Field Camp Coloring Books are available to me. Private purchase. You know my office is. Alright, last three digits are five, four, eight. For the pencils. Anybody? Five, four, eight. I'm going to pull another one, quickly. Uh, the last three digits are 561. Here comes Lily. Yay! Here she comes. <laughs> Did you say you'd sell it? Yeah. <laughs> Good, okay. Last one. The uh, Paul Parmentier Brunton. Very generous donation. Number five three nine. Oh my God! It's you on it. Oh my gosh! It's Mr. Dylan Garcia. Hold on, Miss Paul. Oh, she can write your thank you note. Okay, so w this is one of the best parts of uh, Research Day. It's not just undergraduate and graduate students presenting their research to all of us in this sort of friendly environment, but also the involvement of the South Coast Geological Society who meet the first Monday of every month in Costa Mesa. We encourage all of our students to go and to become members and become friends with them and to become really good friends with them. And uh, <laughs> anyway, leave it at that. So uh, without further ado, what we're going to do, I'm going to introduce Paul Parmentier, who's the acting president of South Coast Geological Society, and he will talk to you about some of the students he would like to recognize uh, specifically. So uh, give a hand for Paul Parmentier. On behalf of the South Coast Geographic Society, I want to thank you for inviting us. We love to come to these events. It makes us want to go back to school and get our job. <laughs> I know you, you can't wait to get into the working world. We can't wait to go do something else. So, uh, that's how that works. Uh, but we're very thankful and we always appreciate seeing you at our meetings. Uh, I think you find it useful to mix with working geologists and sometimes eventually that might lead to a, you to a job when you do graduate. So looking forward to seeing you there too. It's really tough. First, it was a pleasure to go around. It's really tough. I feel like one of those guys on American Idol, one of those I had to pick. It's a terrible, terrible job. It's, it's very. Uh, but uh, we were very uh, impressed with everyone. Uh, we liked the proposals because you can feel the enthusiasm for the students. I want to go do this. I don't know what I'm going to find out, but I want to do that, and that's that's like, exciting too. Uh, but we had to pick three persons. Uh, first, a little bit. I. I was happy to hand out my Brunton. I don't do any field work anymore to, to reuse it. And uh, it's one that I got when I was a student. It's gone all over the world. And so whoever got it, I can talk to you about the, the Brunton story a little bit. And so we had to pick three students. Uh, a lot of fights among us, but eventually I got to rule because I'm the president this year. So. <laughs> uh, the first award would go to Zachary Haygood for the work. <laughs> Thank you. 
inviting us. Thank you. Thanks again to South Coast for uh, coming and participating as they, they have for the last few years. It's re really great. We really appreciate the uh, connection we have with all of you. And thanks to all the students for the great job you've done on your posters. You all deserve a great round of applause. And I wanted to put in here uh, at the last to say thank you to Brandon for organizing all of this. He's uh, done this. He's done this for three years now, and we really appreciate the, uh, the time and effort that he's put into it. So, thank you all. Okay, congratulations everyone. Thanks again for coming. Uh, we have the space for another 20 minutes or so, so if you didn't get to talk science to that one person you wanted to, that one person you should go, because now is the time to do it. Anyway, thanks everyone for coming. Uh, if you have a little bit of time after, I'd really like some help cleaning up some things. We have the truck up there, we just need to load it and uh, pile it uh, neatly back in Otto's office. Uh, we can come in Monday thrilled to see this large thing. But anyway, congratulations again. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you to the South Coast Geological Society. Have a great weekend, everyone. Thanks. Clean up all the recycle that you made. That's right.